Hello, and welcome to the Voice of the Patient podcast. We are the podcast working to change lives, that is, improve the quality of life through not only hearing, but truly listening to the voice of the patient. Hello, and thank you for the download of the Voice of the Patient podcast. We really appreciate your support. And I want to give a brief introduction for this episode today with Jared Updike. And Jared shares his experience with pain, and it's really a wonderful conversation, and I'm very grateful to Jared for coming on. And we talk about a lot of resources for healthcare providers to to utilize with regard to pain. And I first want to mention that this podcast was inspired by a blog post that Jared wrote. And that post is linked in the show notes. It is called Dr. Masseuse on his personal blog. And I found out about the blog post from Paul Ingram, who had written a post on his website, painscience.com, and that inspired me to ask Jared to come onto the show. And we also mentioned a lot of other resources with information about pain and pain science. So if you're looking for anything to dive into after this episode, please look also into the show notes for some of those resources. Particularly if you are looking for a, another podcast to listen to, check out Dr. Karen Litzy's podcast, Healthy, Wealthy, and Smart, and her episode with David Butler. It is really a terrific introduction to some of the work that that he has done. And then there's an entire podcast from Dr. Sandy Hilton and Corey Blickenstaff called Pain Science and Sensibility. It's a wonderful journal club, essentially, about some articles about pain science. And then there is an amazing blog from... Dr. Bronnie Thompson called Health Skills. And please check out all of those resources along with Paul Ingram's painscience.com. Thank you so much and enjoy the episode. Hello, everyone, and thank you for tuning in again to the Voice of the Patient podcast. I am your host, Zach Stearns, and today our guest is Jared Updike. Jared is a Los Angeles based software developer who learned about chronic pain and fatigue at the School of Hard Knocks. He hopes other sufferers can become their own health advocates, learning to manage their issues through patient education and their own informed, considered experimentation. He dishes out life advice and writes about technology, photography, and his programming projects at his blog, Jared Editorial, at jared.updike.org. You can follow him on Twitter as well, at Jared Updike. Jared, thank you so much for coming on to the show. Thank you for having me. Great. Well, I, to our listeners, would like to say that I found out about Jared from a blog post that he had written, and it that post was actually shared by Paul Ingram at painscience.com. And it definitely caught my attention, and so I was reading it, and it did not take long at all for me to think that this is a story that really any healthcare provider should hear, particularly if that healthcare provider works with those who have had chronic pain or fatigue. Without any further ado, Jared, could you tell your story as a patient? You mentioned at the top that I'm a software developer, and that's something that I've been doing for a long time. I started programming at age eight. And for me, it's always been a sort of creative expression. And because I was encouraged by my older brother and started programming so young, I was pushed into sort of a math and science track by my dad and my my siblings um, because they said it would be helpful to make my little video games and stuff if I was better at math. So I kind of got a head start on that. Um, Fast forward a few years, I graduated from Caltech with a four-year degree in computer science and started working um, as a software engineer at a nonprofit in an academic setting. It was actually in uh, medical research. And in the meantime, I started a project with my wife to see all 59 national parks. So in terms of the way we like to spend our time, Mm -hmm. um, vacations and hobbies and stuff, we've been doing a lot of photography and visiting the national parks. And as of March 2017, we've seen 56 out of the 59 national parks, which has been really exciting. And the reason I mentioned this, the idea of programming to me as a creative outlet is that 
if you have a hobby that's too similar to your your uh, worky work, you know, your jobby job, mm, right. then then it kind of puts pressure on you from both ends, and then it 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 doesn't let one be an outlet, I guess. Mm. So the heart of the story is in let's say 2010 or 2012 time frame after I stopped working at that um, nonprofit, which was it was a good environment. It was not super high pressure. It was fairly laid back and the hours were totally reasonable. I started working at a fancy startup and there's startup mentality has different approach to just how things are done. There's like a certain kind of pressure. There's a kind of like change the world Mm -hmm. sort of not cult like thing, but there's just a weird mentality. Um, and there's a lot of positives and negatives about that. So I really enjoyed my coworkers. I thought I had some of the most interesting and hardworking and intelligent and creative people I've worked with. And I learned a lot about um, an interesting domain, which was at the time it's spatial computing, which as of seven years later is still the future. So Mm -hmm. that's a a hint that it didn't go super far (laughs) in terms of a business, but, um, but it was an enjoyable and interesting thing to do. But that was the, the time when, in addition to learning to be on a team with other developers, I also learned what it's like to, have RSA problems and sort of mm. work-related uh, pain issues. And so that also coincided with me turning 30. And and looking back on it now, I can see I didn't realize that I had that youthful superpower of just being able to take my body for granted for a lot of years. Mm-hmm. And as a person who gets excited about things and someone who likes learning and likes working hard and sort of likes to go all in on everything, I feel like that worked against me when it came to a point in my life where my body couldn't keep up with that as much. So all those factors converged and I was doing some intense side projects because that was like kind of my outlet for all the stress at work was somehow getting poured into the things that I was interested in feeling like, Oh, I'll never be able to work on these unless I figure out how to do it. So I'd stay up late doing that. And even though I was active walking like three or more miles a day to take the bus and the train, it wasn't the kind of exercise that helped me feel better, which would have been more like moderate, strenuous exercise. It just added to my whole body feeling beaten down, I guess, is the one way to look at it. So at the time I, that I started having problems, I went to the HR department, which was like one or two people at a small company. And like a lot of startups, you'll hear this, they either have like a, oh, we have no, we have unlimited vacation, which is like a code for no vacation. Right, right. Or we have we don't have sick days. Just t- tell your supervisor and stuff. So since they didn't have a policy laid down that caused problems, mm. um, for anyone listening out there, if you're thinking of starting a company, just pick pick a number. Like just <laughs> pick a number of sick days, and if if you need to adjust it, you can deal with that. But that yeah. helps people know what's going on in terms of reporting their hours and all that stuff. Right. So, and then this also coincided with switching between different insurance. Um, since I hadn't since I was young, I hadn't used a lot of health insurance. My wife thought it would be good to switch to a more affordable one, but then that coincided with needing to actually see a doctor who knew what he was talking about. Mm. So then we ended up switching back. And so those sorts of things. And the whole idea that you need to keep your job to keep health coverage Mm. is a very stressful catch 22. If your job, if it feels like your job is hurting you, that all came to a head when there were, was a layoff, even though I'd been helping interview people and hiring we went in the period of a year from like 30 people to like 60 people or something. There was a layoff where like 20 people were laid off. And then during that time, I found a new job pretty quickly, but I just didn't feel prepared physically to deal with the stress of onboarding on a new job, even though it was something I was excited about. Mm-hmm. It was a fairly healthy environment. I had something either in my head or really had problems that I hadn't finished working out physically or some combination of those things. So I went on leave and tried to work through that as fast as I could with physical therapists and doctors to try to figure out, is there anything I can actually do to make this better? Mm -hmm. And in that time period, I, because of that isolation and stuff and frustration, I ended up having an overuse injury on my legs. And then I felt like now my upper body and shoulders and back and hands are all hurting and I can't type. And now I can't walk around because something weird happened to my legs and doctors won't tell me what's going on. So it just became like more than I could handle. And then I came back to work and they had said, oh, you didn't hear about it because it was a publicly traded company. And they said, we've been having rounds of layoffs. And then, I, you know, the day I came back, they're like, yeah, you've been laid off. In a way, it was a relief, but it was also like, 
is this the universe telling me, you know, you're trying to do what you can, you're trying to stick to it and keep working, but then you come back to work and you've been laid off. Like, I don't know, maybe I put too much meaning in that or maybe not. But then I, then that was when I was at the new low where I had to figure out what am I going to do? Can I work again? Can I have hobbies and can I go on vacations and keep doing this photography thing? And like, how do I not stress my wife out? How do I just rebuild my life from the pieces that I have? So it sounds pretty bleak. And it was at the time and that sort of depression fed through. And, you know, as a psychology major, that there's a lot of issues that people have with pain and mood and emotion and stuff like that. And that certainly was a a part of the cause. So that was another catch 22, which was if my mood was higher, I would have had more energy to do something about it, like exercise consistently or something. But so fast forward to 2013, I found a really great job that I'm really happy with at a small company. We make product, productivity software. It's not a startup, so that's good. They have, you know, it's not like someday we'll have revenue. It's like we have paying customers right. who really love the product. And I've been there for about three and a half years. I'm currently working three days a week. And sometimes I can work at home since I have a laptop and I can just work extra hours. But I like that arrangement because it shows that it's better to be doing something where it feels like I'm a whole person at least. Yeah, absolutely. And it removes a whole lot of stress. I imagine the, the whole thought of, yeah, someday, you know, we're going to make it, you know, we just have to believe in it. And and so that takes, that takes, and I can imagine I, for me personally, I don't know that I could live in that sort of startup mentality because of the stress of the unknown. So I can imagine that really, that really helps. Yeah. I enjoy the fact that we have users who tell us what they think of the software and what they want, and they're very vocal about it. And we, we try to listen to the parts we can fix. We try to put our own spin on things, but it's a really good feeling to have a structure in my life and to have, to feel like I'm part of something, even if it's small, something that I am appreciated for what I can do professionally and that I have something to look forward to, you know, just a day to day sort of thing. It's nice. Sure. Absolutely. So there's so much in that story that I'd like to get to. First, could you talk a little bit more about your visits to, you had mentioned doctors, you'd mentioned physical therapists. Can yeah. you talk about the visits that you had and and the process of that going back to, you know, whether there are either challenges from those conversations or encouraging things from those conversations? Sure. So the first doctor I saw diagnosed me with psychogenic pain. And that to me, I, I just don't like the term. I feel like it, it's sort of a truism. It feels like it's like a doctor, you ask him, like, I'm hurting, and I don't know what to do about it. And the doctor says, you have pain that's being sent out by your brain to the rest of your body. And it's like, well, that's what pain is. So (laughs) it didn't didn't tell you. It's like, you go to a doctor, you say, doctor, I tried exercising, and it's just not sticking, like I'm having exercise resistance. And they're like, oh, it sounds like you're having exercise resistance, you should exercise. Like, (laughs) that that sort of mentality, It, it wasn't exactly what doctors said. But the effect of the visit was not any worse than if, if we'd had like a one a two line text exchange if I said like I'm in pain and the doctor says it sounds like you're in pain you should yeah. <laughs> you know whatever yeah. so the first the first GP I saw was not very helpful but I saw a few more who did listen and did refer me out to different specialists as I was bouncing around insurance I saw a PA who said go get an MRI and then the, I got an MRI and the radiologist found all kinds of tiny things that are like not a big deal because mm-hmm. that's another notorious thing is imaging misses things right or catches things that aren't there sure and it's very expensive um (laughs) (laughs) and then you have to have a doctor interpret it and then the doctor just says take a half a jar of anti-inflammatories every day it's like that's also not good advice it doesn't help for chronic pain or at least certain kinds of chronic pain that aren't inflammation based right eventually now we're back with Kaiser and they, at least they feel like they have more structure to it. So when they give you advice, it's not just like one independent doctor trying to make a lot of money or something running a practice. They have a system where their goal is to help patients long-term because you're in their insurance. And so if they can actually come up with things that help all of their patients and come up with policies that minimize the costs of the doctor's time and everything, then they, they save money. So it felt like they had more together. And so eventually I bounced through a physical medicine doctor who didn't have too many options available. We can talk about that too. 
And then he eventually referred me to the pain psychologist, and that's where I had a lot more success. I did. He he also did refer me to a physical therapist, who I think listened more than others, and he gave me specific things to try, mostly exercises, and he did talk about the mind body connection and stuff. But it was something that it's a really hard thing to get a patient to get much out of at a visit. Um, you know, he can give you printouts or say like, Oh, read this book and that kind of thing. And the truth was he, he was onto something. And so that was some of the more, it's just a lesson that's hard to internalize. Um, that was some of the more useful advice that I wasn't, maybe wasn't quite ready for, or didn't have a framework within which to, to internalize it. But it is a strange thing to think like you go to a physical therapist and you ask for help and they say, here, read this book, but <laughs> maybe it would help. So I don't know. And well, that's, that's a tough thing because there are a lot of amazing books out there, of course, but <laughs> that's not why you, that's just not why you go to an actual visit with a person and uh, have a physical presence with someone is to just get a recommendation and be on your way. Right. That's right. You know, you're, you're paying for the time or, or your insurance is paying for the time uh, that you spend in that office. So the amount of time that you spend reading that book, not in that office, <laughs> then, and that to me, it sounds like a visit that should not be billed, correct? I mean, it's, I don't know. It, it feels that way. Yeah, I can, looking back, I mean, he didn't just say, oh, go read this book. He's saying that there is a lot. I think he, since he was a more uh, older and more experienced PT, he hadn't been around after more rounds of this pain science research, which we can also talk more about. Right. But he knew about it enough to know that there was something to it, which is, it's not just like, oh, it's in your head or like, you know, have a positive attitude. It's not that simple. We can, we'll definitely talk more about this, but, uh, he did indicate that there really is a legitimate connection between how people think about things. And as Gabriella mentioned on previous podcasts, pain catastrophizing, that kind of stuff, it does make a huge difference in how you adjust and respond and how you train yourself to experience pain and, uh, and whether you suffer or you're making your suffering worse through your habits and mental habits and through all, all sorts of things. Anyway, it's a complicated thing to untangle, which you saw in the, my blog post. Right. It is very complicated and there's a whole lot to go into it. First, I'll say from the top, that term psychogenic pain kind right. of uh, caught me off guard because it's not really how we talk about pain. And in physical therapy – the the relationship between physical therapy and pain science is complex at the moment, but getting better all the time. And I can say for, for me and my experience that my my education in, in physical therapy school, we is very fond of pain science and we learn a lot about it and it's and it's been very helpful. But that term psychogenic pain doesn't really come up. I think yeah, I think this doctor was educated in another country mm -hmm. like at least thirty or forty years ago. Um, the term that they use now is psychosomatic or psychosomatic pain or something like that, but it, it, it's just not worth even mentioning like the terminology because we can talk more about the actual pain science. And I think that's more useful. Yeah. Because all of that, whether you call it psychogenic or psychosomatic is not really consistent with the pain science. Right. And so it's worth, it's worth getting into a little bit. One is you had mentioned about your MRI. And yeah. with the MRI, and th so this is where we kind of start off our pain science education in physical therapy, is the is seeing that actual, like the pathoanatomy, the actual imaging results, is not predictive of pain. Right. And that there are many people who are in pain who might get negative imaging. There might, there, and then there are many people who would get sort of positive findings on imaging and be in no pain at all. Right. Yeah. I heard an example of that where they said, have you ever had a bruise on a part of your body where you don't remember it happening there? You've had tissue damage without yeah. actually experiencing pain. Correct. And then vice versa where something hurts like crazy and you examine it and it's like, I don't think there's anything wrong here. I mean, we can't find any tissue damage. Absolutely. And I'll just uh, use this as a time to plug your uh, post is that you actually reference the book explain pain by David mm -hmm. Butler and Laura Mosley. So this book is a book that many people in physical therapy or just in any healthcare profession, we love to, you know, brag about this book. So you got to read this book and here you are, Linking to this book, that really just goes to show the dedication to, to researching about this. And it's, it's, it sets an amazing example to providers to find out more about pain. Some of this was uh, handouts in our 
in our pain psychology group. So I will give credit to the people who showed pointed these things out to me, and also uh, Paul Ingram on in PainScience.com. He obviously has millions of links to everything, and he's sorted through tons of information. But he linked to the work of uh, Lorimer Mosley, um, and that stuff is the closest thing to a way to help people get out of the trap of chronic pain because it actually explains what's happening and why it's so challenging. Right. Could you talk a little bit about how you felt sort of finding out about some of these pain science uh, facts? Because it's, it, you see different responses from different people. That's a good point. Um, isn't that weird for me? I think I was disappointed. I was deflated that medicine didn't have an answer. Mm -hmm. Um, it's a complicated thing about my own journey into like, just becoming a logical person through tens of thousands of hours of programming mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> and other various reasons. But I felt like I thought science might be able to provide an answer. At first it wasn't. And then later it started to show these really uncanny and interesting things that showed that there was more going on and that it wasn't just a matter of like some sort of simple thing, like just think, think more positively or just go out there and do it. It's like one example is the type of stuff they've done in pain science where they show Okay, what they do is they, they get a rubber hand that they place next to your hand. They block your view of your own hand. They stroke the rubber hand with like a Q-tip and the back of your hand at the same time, okay? So you're feeling, you, your brain doesn't see it your own hand. You just see this experience of something that's right next to it visually. And your brain remaps to think that the rubber hand is your hand. And then they put something uncomfortable. They don't actually hurt you, but they puts like a cold piece of metal on the back of your hand that's uncomfortably cold and you experience pain in the rubber glove like in the rubber hand which is nuts like you shouldn't be able to experience pain outside your body but that goes to show that pain is weird and pain is not doesn't work the way you expect some of these experiments are like really interesting and really uncanny like they're not yeah the, the brain is pushing out pain and it's not logical, I guess. It's not It's not logical. And I remember hearing about this story. I can't remember if this is one of Lorimer Mosley's. I'll have to... I think so, yeah. Think, There's a YouTube oh, video where he talks right. about it. Yeah, so that's just amazing to... Oh, right, because I think he mentions this in his TEDx talk. Uh, his, yes, his, that's his, the one, yeah. Yeah, and so he mentions that, uh, for those not familiar with the talk, I will definitely link it, and I definitely recommend it, that you that you get asked, like, oh, are you in pain? Yeah, where is it? Where does it hurt? There. And you point over to there. Out, over there, outside of your body. And so it's a, it's a mind-blowing thing, but I love that you uh, mentioned that really sort of seeing that it is weird and that the you can see from the, the science of it that it is so complex, that there's actually a, a sort of a reassuring nature of that, even though it's not as simple as like a math problem of why you're in pain. You know, it's right. not something so concrete. And I think that's what I think that's why there's a lot of pushback, even in those who are in healthcare professions, to see that it's not really black and white. It's not concrete and it's not simple. That, that can be a really hard thing to to really accept. Yeah, I think I think part of the reason it's a challenge is because pain is so subjective, there's no imaging test that can accurately measure it, and there probably never will be. It doesn't mean that providers can't help patients learn to help themselves. And I think that's kind of sort of the theme of that article that I posted on my blog, mm -hmm. which is at some point I started to see that what people were suggesting was true and that I could learn what worked for me and I could I could find out a combination of things that were based on reality and weren't based on like false hope or anything. But they weren't promising an instant cure, but they were they were geared toward moving me forward and that they were based on I don't know, large groups of other people's experience, but also on things that I could test safely and I could test inexpensively. And that that gave me a lot of confidence and a lot of, well, and desire to to experiment in other ways and see what works. But also it gave me, it, get, it got me over the hump because I, I figured I could manage things myself. Like I could become an expert at what what worked for my own body. And no no one would ever know as much as I would about what that's like or what what works for me, I guess. Right. You're the expert of what's going on with you, right? That's, yes. So that's, and that's something that is just really worth 
emphasizing for providers listening is that it can be incredibly frustrating to have someone tell you not only how you should be feeling, but how you are feeling when yeah. <laughs> it makes no sense. So I'd like to point out that, uh, that in your post, I love how you laid out and very methodically, what is the, the contributing factor to what's going on and what are some, some possible things that could either remedy that or alleviate that. And then so you, and you list out exactly what those are with even some uh, footnotes for, for information <laughs> about those. And the, I, it was one of my favorite things about your post was reading through the footnotes and they were just incredibly thoughtful with really good resources and very well researched. Um, so could you, could you talk about your process of developing that chart? Is that something you did for this post or something you've been doing just for years? I'd had this idea of a blog post I wanted to do maybe six months ago mm -hmm. I, in a one of these fit of peaks in the morning that I have um, where I feel like I could do this giant thing all at once when I have like a burst of hours of energy. I wrote down in my journal that format based on sort of the tail end of a few years of what I'd been doing. Mm -hmm. And then it just sat there collecting dust until I started corresponding with uh, Paul Ingram of painscience.com. Mm -hmm. And he was writing some stuff about fibromyalgia and uh, as well as my, my favorite treatment we can talk about as well, which is aqua jogging or deep water swimming. Mm -hmm. um, and so he asked me to do quick proofreading of some of the stuff he was working on and giving him feedback. And then the feedback email got long enough that I'm like, I'll just write an article about this and then I can put up all my own stuff and go into like way too much detail. And then when he, once I finally posted that, he saw that and he thought, Oh wow, I'm going to share this. So he gave me a heads up and I polished it a little bit more. I guess at that point I realized, first of all, I would go back to my journal that I'd sort of written everything up in a giant list right. and then I'd flesh it out. So that's where that sort of came from. So that, that came from me sitting down and just thinking about the process that I'd gone through for several years. Sure the advice that people had given me and what I'd been trying to continue to do as daily and weekly habits. Awesome. So you had mentioned aqua jogging and that is listed on one of the possible uh, remedies. Could you talk a little bit about that? Sure. So aqua jogging involves getting a neutral buoyancy belt. It's sort of like, it looks kind of like a WWE uh, championship <laughs> belt or something like that. Like a, like the size of a hubcap oh, all right. sort of radius. <laughs> It's not shiny or anything. It's just made of this floating blue foam. Okay. So you wrap that around you, click it in, and then you okay. you have to find water that's deep enough that you don't hit the bottom with your feet. Mm -hmm. When you jump in the pool, your head is above water and you're you're neutrally buoyant. So that means you're not treading water. And it's not as much effort to just avoid drowning. But instead of swimming, where swimming involves a lot of doing the crawl, involves a lot of you know, shoulder movement and stuff and kicking, which is pretty intense. Mm -hmm. But aqua jogging, even if you just put that on and float it in the pool for a half hour, it would be its own kind of therapy, just doing something where you're giving your body a different experience. The water keeps you cool. Mm -hmm. But then once you're in the water and you're looking at the clock and thinking, how long am I going to be in here? <laughs> you just start do you start doing a movement where you just naturally are able to move through the pool the way you would walk if you were like swimming or flying in a dream or something. So it's very resistive because it slows you down a lot. You're not going to win any race that way, obviously, but that's part of what makes it work really well is you get a little bit of resistance exercise at the same time. So I've been doing that since 2013. Mm -hmm. Most of the people I've run into who are in this corner of the pool where it's set aside for doing aqua jogging are older folks or people working through their own, um, you know, knee replacements or those sorts of things. Right. So that, that shows me that getting in the pool is like a really interesting thing. I wish someone would have suggested, I guess no one knew about it, but I kind of discovered it by accident. We went to the pool one weekend and they had that equipment available. So eventually I bought my own. Awesome. Sure. I have seen uh, several clinics actually that incorporate aquatic uh, therapy as part of the physical therapy session, particularly one clinic uh, for one of my internships. There were some therapists who spent much of their time in the pool. And so that was that was something really great to see. And I could see that that would offer a lot of benefit really just to provide an opportunity to to do something that did what didn't hurt. So and that's, yeah. that's a, that's a really, that was a really encouraging thing for them. It's amazing. Cause it, 
it's non-impact, right? Like your feet, if your feet are hurting to walk around, then now suddenly you can move and it, it's amazing. There's also some benefits from the, the pressure on the water you get. It lowers your, your heart rate about 10 beats per minute on average, something like that. It's nice. It's something that's worth trying, I guess. Sure. That's the thing I liked about it. So how did you find out about aqua jobbing? Yeah. So uh, my wife and I went to the pool one weekend near the end of the summer and they had a section roped off and it said aqua jogging. They had near the kickboards, they had this crate full of uh, this strange equipment. So I grabbed one, my wife grabbed one, we got in the pool. And this was when I was probably near the end of the summer where I kind of was at a low. I didn't know exactly what to expect, but we just messed around in the, the deep end for an hour or something that night I slept so well. I couldn't believe it. Like mm. my, my wife was like the phone rang and you didn't even wake up. Like, like things that are not usually the case for me. Cause uh, you know, it takes a long time to fall asleep for me and I have insomnia. I'm very sensitive as I'm falling asleep, but this just, it knocked me out in a good way. Like I just, it was like, it was almost like magic. I was like, I couldn't believe that result. So it made me want to try going back. Mm. That's really awesome. And sleep is such a, a huge factor as well. It's very overlooked too by healthcare providers. Right. Yeah. You mentioned you're, we're talking about exercise, we're talking about sleep. And that's one of the things that I could see from the provider's point of view, that it would be very challenging to try to help someone, you know, you tell them to come back in a week or two, but what you're trying to do is get their whole life on track. You're trying to help them balance and become like a well-integrated person in like all aspects of their life, almost like a spiritual level. Mm -hmm. And I can see why it was a puzzle that other people couldn't solve for me. They could, you know, try to put me on the right path, but they can't do it for me. Absolutely. So could you talk about a little, going back to your providers, what you had mentioned, the diagnosis of psychogenic pain, did, were any other diagnoses given by doctors? Early on, there was some specific like myofascial pain syndrome and some would say like, oh, there's central sensitization. Maybe you have fibromyalgia, maybe this and that. The funny thing about that is those are diagnosis of, diagnoses of exclusion. I mentioned this on my blog post, but what they do before they diagnose or if they know what they're doing, either of those, is they're supposed to eliminate anything specific that it could be, right? Like, the, you know, they're looking for something structural if you have a problem with your shoulder joint or if it's fibromyalgia, maybe they eliminate anything from your immune system, they send you to a rheumatologist, whatever. But that word fibromyalgia now since 2011 is a term owned by, the, at least in America, the College of Rheumatology. And they define it in a way where they give you this giant survey and they ask you over like a six-month period how, you know, do all these subjective ratings and stuff. So I never was diagnosed formally with that. I'm not a big fan of the fact that there's a word for something that is a diagnosis of exclusion. I can understand that they need it from the point of view of putting people in a bucket and saying like, what was the result of this visit? Do I need to write down a diagnosis code so I can bill it to insurance? Sure. And I don't know. I mean, that's why my term for the things I've been experiencing is just chronic pain and fatigue. It's vague, but that's, that's what I have gone through. Yeah. And I love in one of your, um, when, in one of your notes in the blog, you'd mentioned that you know, some of these diagnoses don't really describe something that a person has, who has the, who is in pain, but it's something that the doctor has. And I thought that was so perfect. And it's a really a good point, but I see a lot of providers go to this other extreme is to say that, well, that they're not real, that they don't exist. Yeah, there are, there are some studies that are pretty solid that show, well, the problem is it, it has a very fuzzy edge. A lot of people who have been diagnosed with fibromyalgia, some of them have it concomitant with other things. Some of them haven't been carefully diagnosed with it or have just sort of, maybe they're just really out of shape and they have a lot of stress. And so effectively, you know, maybe half the country has fibromyalgia or chronic pain or like everyone has myofascial pain once they hit 30. Everyone gets headaches, <laughs> tension headaches. But there have been some studies that do show that there are like functional differences. There's fMRI studies that show with a painful stimulus that it takes longer for chronic pain patients and fibro patients to their, their brain still signal signals like for much longer, like seconds longer than it should, things like that. So there is evidence that that phenomenon is happening. Like the idea that it is a valid diagnosis and the pushback on that, I can sort of see both sides of it. 
-hmm. But the idea that someone couldn't be trapped in chronic pain and that it's like they should get over it, that to me is a dangerous idea too. I think that people should be encouraged that you're not the only one who's going through this. You may be young or you may be having habit happen without any really obvious cause. Like maybe you didn't have any specific injury. Maybe you didn't have any traumatic event directly. It, it, It gets back to this ground of like, the physical therapist isn't there to be your psychologist, but they have to help solve your problem as a complete individual, as a whole person. And I think, I think that you need the patient's buy-in and you need providers who understand that people get stuck in these situations and it is a real thing that happens. Whether or not we have the boundaries or the terminology straightened out, I think there's enough evidence to show how chronic pain affects people and how it's a real thing. Absolutely. Definitely real. And there's still, like you said, there's still some healthcare providers who uh, might be, you know, wondering about the the reality of it. And I'll use this to uh, plug an amazing blog post that I just read the other day from uh, Bronnie Thompson. She is, she is a PhD. She writes a lot about pain. Uh, I'll share this uh, too in the notes about central sensitization, about it being a real mm-hmm. thing. Um, and so there's a lot more research coming out about pain, as you know, particularly with central sensitization. It's, it's a term that gets thrown around without really good consideration of some of the science behind it and about it being real. And so she, she just laid out wonderfully all the, the science behind it. And it's, it really was wonderful piece to read. So I'll share that. And so I also want to mention that you had mentioned how important it is to know that, you know, other people are going through this, going, uh, other people go through the same, uh, same pain, even if it's hard to describe, even if it's hard to really know exactly what is happening. And so with that, you mentioned that the, the group sessions were very important, uh, very meaningful to you. Can you talk a little bit about those and uh, who led those sessions? Yeah, the, we had, at Kaiser, they had a six-week, I think it was twice a week, uh, session for a small group of people, like a room full of people. That was led by the pain psychologist. She would have a physical therapist come in and also demonstrate some things. And then we did, some of it was talking about the theory of like how pain works and giving us handouts and things to read and things to think about. Some of it was, you know, track this yourself. Some of it was try postural things, try this exercise. It was, it was a real blend of a lot of things. And it seems a little like throw it up everything at the wall and see what sticks, but that's maybe what patients need is to know that there are options and that this is all based on the most effective stuff. Mm -hmm. And the fact that a lot of these things are not going to hurt, like if they can move things in the right direction, then, and they're, you know, they're not some huge intervention that could have like really big risks, then you might as well try it because you're already stuck. So it was pretty thorough, though. It was it was pretty structured, and I think teaching patients that they could be in a social setting and that they could make their way across town to get to here to get to these meetings twice a week, and that they could see other people who had and sometimes had like way worse problems than them, like morphine pump or something like that, or like I think it it opened my eyes a little bit that there was some hope, like there was hope that I could manage things and that I could learn stuff. I thought that, that I always liked learning things, so I think this was pretty interesting topic, I guess. Sure. So could you talk a little bit more about uh, what you maybe would have liked your providers to either do more of, do do better? Um, and for me, be coming from a physical therapy point of view, uh, anything particular about your physical therapy sessions too that we can think about? I think that things that I appreciated were, there were some who listened and had a variety of treatment options and advice and they tried to educate me to manage things. They, they tried to set expectations and saying like, if you've had, if you're had these problems for a while, it's not probably not something that's going to go away with like this one exercise, you know, in the next two weeks. Mm -hmm. One thing I wish I'd known, like I wish the providers had had would be like more knowledge about chronic pain and understanding how, let's say someone has reconstructive surgery on their knee or their joint replacement I think it's a little bit more straightforward to say we're going to focus on this part of your body and we're going to work through this and this is how it roughly how it could go and we're going to deal with the details but we'll we'll get through this and you'll be able to walk again versus chronic pain from a lot just kind of lacking like they try to do some of the same things that they would give people for specific problems 
that don't really apply as much for someone who has widespread pain. I don't know, just things that were either a waste of time, like guilt about stretching, like you should be more flexible and you're like, why? Why? What, what is that? What's wrong with not being flexible? And they won't explain how it makes your life better. If they say, well, you can't pick things up off the ground. No, we're talking about like a functional thing that could improve maybe if you were more flexible, but they're not saying you shouldn't be guilty just because you, you're not spending, you know, two hours a day stretching. I feel like right. some of the suggestions weren't as concrete as they could have been. And I think some things were not, not always the best advice for ways to spend time and money, mm-hmm. certain kinds of alternative medicine, there's other better debunkings out there that show what stuff is sort of a waste and what stuff is actually fruitful. But when they sort of say, well, I don't know, try some alternative medicine, that also is frustrating too, because it's like, you'd think that the entire establishment of science and medicine would be able to say like, no, these things actually don't work. Like, don't waste your time and money, but I don't know. But there were things that they could have offered, or they could have at least listed the possible treatments. So we would know by the end of the meeting, like what possible uh, concrete options there were, I think that would have been nice too. Like if if there's a physical therapist or a physical medicine doctor, they say, here's what I can do. I can poke you. I can need, I can insert a needle. I can, you know, refer you over to this. I can do that. I can massage your shoulder or this and that. These are your options. Then at least I would have known what to do instead of saying like, they asked me a question and I sort of give a vague answer. And then we're like sitting there awkwardly. (laughs) Yeah. I think that would have been helpful to actually try to solve one specific problem too. I think that's like, if you're giving someone a diagnosis of myofacial pain and you're saying you have like infraspinatus trigger points or something, whatever the jargon is, yeah. maybe they could actually like try to find a trigger point or like poke you if that's something that they do. I feel like that maybe I would have made progress. Maybe by the end of the day, my shoulder would be less tight and I'd be like, wait, there are maybe options I can do right. to actually make a difference. Right. And then the hard thing there is just with the with the research coming out really in the last decade or two or three that's it just we are learning so much so fast it's kind of it's it's a challenge to keep up right. but um you also set an example and really encourage you know providers that you know you're keeping up right so you should, you, should ex- <laughs> you should expect that of your providers i would think i think that's fair i think i a lot of that education i got just out of frustration reading a lot to figure out what was possible because if if someone wasn't going to just lay it all out and a list, here's the list of treatments. Don't waste your time on these. These usually work. Don't expect a lot from them. Then at least I would know, all right, here's, here's my options. There's nothing more. I'm going to not going to run across some wonder drug that's going to fix it. Right. One thing I want to mention is that one thing that we're talking about as a profession is that to you move into terminology of being persistent pain rather than, rather than chronic pain as oh. really the logic of saying persistent pain is that it's sticking around a little bit longer than would normally be expected. And it may span a, a, a longer time frame than a typical say injury, whether you sprain your ankle that, that doesn't, that doesn't stick around. So with persistent pain, the thought is it's maybe longer than average, but the word chronic can oh. sometimes be a heavy word. Any thoughts about that? Oh, that's a good point. I never thought about that. That's something new that I haven't heard of, but I, I'm all for it. I like the idea of encouraging people not to think that they've come up with some like disease that they have, like that this is your life going forward can't look any different. Mm-hmm. Um, maybe some people will. I think for me, my journey was that I had to accept that maybe it wouldn't be different and that I would be managing it for many years before I started looking back and realizing, wait a minute, I've come really far. It took six months or a year. Well, it took two or three years before I could look back six months or a year and say, this has gotten markedly better. So that was a strange thing. And so like you're saying, maybe I will have recurring issues and things will come and they'll persist. Maybe I'll have spells of low back pain or something, but it won't be something that I'm unequipped to deal with. And I think that that's that's a great way to encourage people saying like, it's a soft tissue thing. Probably we can't tell you how this is going to play out in the next five or 10 years. That's your story. That's your your experience, you get to figure out how this is going to go. And that can be empowering. It's a little intimidating, but I think it can also give people encouragement. Right. Absolutely. And I love that you had said that, that it had gotten better. And so that shows that there is not really this steady, you know, steady state permanence to it, right? That there are changes, you know, whether there are changes over the course of, you know, this day and that day or longer periods. And so I like the thought that of allowing it to change. Rather than rather than keeping it at this sort of unchangeable 
state you know, for, right. and so I, I, I like that idea of, of persistent, but you mentioned a really good point to think about that uh, in some cases, really the way forward for really improving life is to think about, is to think about management rather than to expect to get to like zero out of 10, you know, pain for the rest of your life. Because, right. um, you know, that's not really even realistic for anyone, right? <laughs> because right. If, if you're active, if you do things and if you're inactive and, in, and if you don't do things, right, pain happens. Uh, but to sort of shift to a mindset of management and finding ways, uh, ways to move forward with that, that, that looks like something I really see with your post and, and based on your, on your discussion about it, that finding those strategies for management. Yeah, I, I agree. I think it's so weird if if people knew what they could do each day to move things forward then they might be more willing to do it and be more encouraged but you kind of have to take the leap of faith because no one can tell you what's going to work for you but you if you do the experiment and you play it out over the period of years and it's based on things that are healthy like let's just say you start with twice a week 10 minutes of exercise or something or whatever that ends up becoming you might get bored of doing that for a year if you were consistent about it so you might start upping it to like 15 minutes you might add treading water or some other stroke to your swim routine and you're starting to become more healthy just out of sheer boredom and frustration so you you can't play it all out looking forward but i wish i could just tell people that if you can start managing things, even if the best you get is a managed partial life, you're still getting part of your life back. But the the magic of it is if you stick to it, you can probably get more than that back than you think if you can keep it going. And the worst thing that happens is you have a strategy for dealing with day to day and week to week going forward that will work for you with the hope that maybe it will get better. I don't really want to put myself out there as someone who has all the answers or that, look, I did it. You can do it too because that might give people false hope. And I don't want to say that, look, they said you, you have it forever and no one gets better. Look at me. It's like, well, maybe I didn't have it in the first place, right? Who knows? <laughs> well, it's hard. And the whole topic is tough because it's so different from person to person. So it's really hard to generalize almost anything. And this is true for all of healthcare, actually. It's just that the, the individual variability is, is so huge. But the reality is that you've lined out your story in which there there was progress. And so that still, that still says so much because like you've said before multiple times is that other people are going through very similar types of pain. And we may, we may have a hard time defining that, but that you're not alone. Yeah. The, the numbers are kind of staggering. I think like one or 2% of the U S has some sort of chronic pain issue that they go see doctors about on a regular basis. So when I say you're not alone, I mean like just go out in public and count a few hundred people and like it's you and at least one or two other people. So it's happening. Maybe people are just managing it or coping with it in different ways. Maybe it's visible, maybe it's invisible, but it really is happening. Right. So what else would you like to tell those who may be dealing with persistent pain or fatigue? Be consistent. That sounds like a tall order because you're feeling like, Oh, the last thing I need is like regimented, sort of thing. And that's not who I am. But if you're consistent, the the trick to me for becoming consistent was to be okay with mediocrity, but not to be okay with inconsistency. It's okay if you're not accomplishing everything you used to. You can phone it in, you can go through the motions, but show up. And if you do that, the change will come over time. But if you ever say, I tried exercise and then gave up, well, then it's never going to work for you. But if you, if you say, I went through really bad spell of a month, but I still went to the pool. I climbed in the water and I watched the clock for five minutes and I got back out of the water and that was the best I could do that day. If that's the case, you still kept your habit going and that will probably save you in the long run. Other advice would be to be kind to yourself, be gentle with yourself. Like people may be asking a lot of you, people may be having their expectations, but if you feel like you need to give yourself more time and space to, to just deal with things, that's okay. Like you're here and you don't need to rush it and it, things will come on their own time frame. And another thing that I wish I'd known, but if my future self told me, I'd probably be bothered by it would be just try not to pity yourself. Like everyone eventually experiences some kind of debilitating pain, fatigue, or some sort of debilitating problem. It's just a question of when. 
It could be at the end of your life. It could be at the end of a long life. It could be all of a sudden. But if you hit it early in your life like I did and you come up with a strategy for dealing with it, then you'll be ahead of other people. So the worst thing that happens is now you've got an exercise habit, which is not the worst thing that happens. So. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. That's awesome. And I really appreciate you saying that. And so now for other providers, any other things that you'd like to tell providers who spend time with those in pain or or dealing with fatigue? I had a lot of specific things. I wish that someone had told me about aqua jogging. It may not work for everyone, but it did work for me. I wish someone had told me more about how pain and chronic pain are, are weird and it really does happen. I, I kind of wish doctors wouldn't recommend in, ineffective treatments. One example is antidepressants. There's, I have a link to it on my blog post, but they might help some people. Maybe they'll, you know, sort of jerk you out of a, like a, a low point in your life. And if you have depressive symptoms and you're working with a psychi- psychiatrist or a psychologist, that's fine. I'm not trying to tell people, oh yeah, get off meds. It's all bad. Right. But I wish the doctors would be more realistic about the effectiveness and what the risks are because they'll say, oh, just try it. But it's like, in a way, you're giving people false hope if that's not even that effective of a drug, if it's like barely more effective than placebo. So Mm -hmm. it may not be the best use of time and money and it could have other risk factors. I just wish that someone had listed through all the treatments and and told me like what the likelihood of working would be and what the, the likely outcomes were and what treatments were actually inexpensive to try and things that I could experiment with on on my own. One thing that's been really helpful for me, or at least I think it's been helpful, it's hard to actually pin it down in terms of separating out which treatments were the most effective. Um, I'd spent a lot of time learning about muscle anatomy and pain referral patterns. And it's strange because massage therapy and like the term trigger point and stuff like this, it's all very loaded. And there's a lot of sort of over-promising and under-delivering in the alternative medicine field. But I wish someone had sat me down and explained that the pain referral patterns, the muscle pain patterns, those are solid science. Those are things that you can reproduce by injecting people with needles. And they did, they've done this. It's old information. It goes back to the 30s. You can read about it. But muscle pain is strange because when you have not necessarily tissue damage, but some sort of like contraction or a small muscle knot in one part of your body, you can experience the pain somewhere di- different. Right. And I think if people knew that, then they would understand that they could actually start experimenting and learning about their own muscle pain patterns, and then they would be less freaked out about things. Because you can have extremely painful knots in your shoulders or upper back or whatever that you feel like there must be something wrong with my spine or a nerve, but it turns out, not not that you can't have problems with those things, but it turns out, at least for me, a lot of that was soft tissue things that I could manage on my own with a tennis ball by practicing rubbing different spots in my body and stuff. So the information's out there and you can learn it, that gave me a lot more confidence too. Because now, instead of freaking out, I can think, oh, that's a new sensation I've never had. Whereas before, it would have been like, oh, great, now my job's over. You know? <laughs> yeah, that's a really good point. And so we, as healthcare providers, it's definitely our responsibility to be aware of that too. So we don't want to say, oh, well, no, that's that's weird. you know. And, then, and because that really sort of sends the message that uh, the person in pain, you know, might have to do some of the research on their own, which isn't really, uh, it's not very encouraging to me. So. Yeah, the I wish some of the physical therapists and doctors had actually tried to diagnose at least one specific problem. If they had said, okay, let's, let's like go through this process, because it is possible to do, you may not be able to do it for all patients, and you may not be able to fix the thing that's causing that. Let's say someone has really bad posture, and they're getting uh, trigger points or like muscle knots in their trapezius and their rhomboids and their infraspinatus muscles from like mousing too far to the right, like they rotate their shoulder out a ton. Mm-hmm. You could at least start poking them and seeing if you can narrow down a place. Like, does it feel better when I rub this knot? Like, do you feel a sensation? Do you feel this sort of pain referral pattern and stuff like that? Mm-hmm. Then it would show you that, oh, wow, like it's not just in my head and my attitude. There's also legitimate stuff happening in in my body and in my tissues that I can also work on massaging those things or somehow getting those muscles to relax and try to solve the problems as they come up instead of letting them sort of grow until my whole body's full of muscle knots or something. Another thing about that is even if we can't solve all of the science for all patients, it may be possible for a patient to spend a lot more time going through those things on their own, if that makes sense. So the amount of time I've spent trying to figure out and diagnose and either partially remedy those things is it would be like thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars of hours of 
of manual therapy, but I was able to do that because it's inexpensive and I have all the time mm-hmm. to, to do this. So I would encourage patients to think about things that way, like what they could become the expert on. Like, can they figure out what, for example, what their limits are and what makes it so that it's safe for them to do the things that they want to do if it's walking around or spending time with their family or whatever it happens to be. If they can become like their own doctor, solving that puzzle and drawing lines where they need to draw those lines, you know, a doctor isn't going to just diagnose, like give you a prescription saying, you know, don't sit at a table talking to your family for more than an hour. But you might be able to figure out for yourself that if you spend more than 30 minutes um, socializing that you have a pain, a flare up. So, you you know, you can draw that line yourself and you can say this is working for me and you can keep that going and then make progress. Awesome. Well, uh, Jared, I also have to ask. So, like, how are things going now uh, l- lately? You know, and also since the blog post. <sighs> Uh, things are going well. I, I don't know exactly what happened, but in the last year, as at least as, as of 2017, I'm just seeing a doctor in terms of annual checkups and some blood work and stuff, but I'm not like doing any kind of specific physical therapy, new things and solving new problems. I'm just trying to keep things going. I guess I'm trying to maintain and manage I mentioned all the things in the blog post, but I do my own exercise. A lot of those were things taught to me by some physical therapist. So if I said that it wasn't effective, then I still believe it enough to do it regularly. So <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Well, it's been really great uh, talking to you. Um, and I really thank you very much for coming on to the show. Thank you for having me. Yeah. Uh, any other parting words? I just want to encourage people that if they can change how they think about stuff and practice and train themselves they can actually make progress, even if it's not what they want or what they expect. It will probably end up being surprising in a positive way. If you ask yourself these questions like, how will I spend my time instead of thinking, what will I accomplish? We have a world that's driven so much by results. But if you think, what do I want to do with my time? How will I do that? That can help you alleviate some of that pressure and sort of focus on what you can do. What habits, however small, will move me forward? What can I do in terms of showing up even on my worst day? And how can I accommodate my limitations without giving up completely? Or how can I avoid, you know, ignoring my limitations to my detriment, but still try to do the things that give my life meaning and give me a reason to be around and to keep moving forward. Perfect. That's awesome. And your story is really inspiring. And it's, I've, I'm very honored actually to be able to talk to you about it. And, and it really, it's really inspires me as going into the profession. Uh, so I'm, I'm very, very thankful for that. Thank you. And thank you for sharing it with other providers, other physical therapists. Absolutely. Um, Okay. And by the way, what, so what three parks are left? You said 56 out of 59. Is that right? Yes. Um, There are two in Alaska, north of the Arctic Circle that we haven't been to, Kobuk Valley and Gates of the Arctic. And there's one in American Samoa, which is another five hour flight from Hawaii. You have to go through Fiji. So those are the two we haven't done. Yeah, well, I understand why that those are uh, the challenging last ones to get, but uh, that's really awesome. Okay. So uh, thank you again, Jared. And that concludes our episode of the voice of the patient. If you enjoyed this episode, or if you have a story to tell as a patient, a provider, or both, then please let us know. You can find me on Twitter at Zach R. Stearns and Dave Reed on Twitter at DReedPT. Thank you for listening and keep listening to the voice of the patient. If you enjoyed this episode, go to thevoiceofthepatient.org where you can find other helpful podcasts and blog posts that will show you how to improve healthcare through not only hearing, but truly listening to the voice of the patient. Thanks for listening. This podcast is brought to you in partnership with the Senior Rehab Project at SeniorRehabProject.com.